Welcome to the first lecture, mini lecture, for EDF 5641. Um, this lecture is really going to just talk a little bit about English as an international language. Um, and the purpose of this mini lecture is really just to kind of <clears throat> think about what you've read. Uh, there's a lot of research to say that sometimes when we read something, then we hear about it, and then we actually do activities um, such as the, the online activities, there's a much better um, chance that we'll actually remember and internalize some of these things. So this is your opportunity to, to read about these concepts, to hear about it again through this format, and then to actually kind of manipulate and, and actually do activities that help you discuss and internalize these ideas. So the question is, who owns English? Now this has always been a very interesting question because I think um, and we'll talk about this in, in the next slide, is that a lot of times language becomes something about nationality. And, um, and clearly because of the role of globalization, um, English is no longer a national language. It, it's much more than that. Um, Crashy talks about the three circles view. So he talks about there's the, the inner um, countries that, that speak English um, as, you know, soon, that you know, particularly immigrants and other people who come in. So the main language is English, and then students that come in who don't speak English learn it as, as English as a second language or English as an additional language. Now, interestingly, in Australia, we've moved for, away from English as a second language to English as an additional language. And a big reason for that is it's really kind of acknowledging that students actually may begin studying English and have a variety of languages. They may be multilingual. And so it's recognizing multilingualism and bilingualism instead of just saying, oh, English is your, your second language. Um, because there could be several languages that the student actually knows. It could be an additional language. <clears throat> and then there's the outer countries such as India and Singapore who may have English um, as a national language, but they that country um, has a variety of national languages and English is one of them. And then the expanding circle, which is where English is usually taught as a foreign language. Um, and the interesting thing about his Crashy's research is that it's it's in some ways, and it's 1985, and his numbers of where he felt there were, you know, the in, inner circle countries and the outer circle countries and expanding, those numbers are very different now. And I think in some ways, while it's a very helpful model to kind of think about um, English teaching in those different, you know, especially English as an additional language in the country where, in a country where English is mostly spoken compared to a country where English is not spoken um, in most places. I think that's an important distinction to make, but I also think that these circles, the, the lines between the inner, outer, and expanding are, are becoming a bit more gray because of the way that English has become an international language. Um, and so, and because families are, I think sometimes we look at things based on trends of a country, but knowing that each family is very different, and we have so many families, even for myself, um, you know, I'm married to Australian, I'm American, um, inevitably my children will have Australian accents, which is quite funny for my family to, to hear that. Um, and at one time we lived overseas, so we were living in a country um, that spoke a different language, yet we had very different accents and so on. So, you know, the way that our, our um, world is changing and the effects of globalization means that these, these different circles are a bit harder to define. Um, and, you know, we can have schools in you know, what we consider the expanding circle, but that are English speaking schools. And, you know, so there's, there's, there's a lot of room to kind of say that these lines and these circles are not as clear as they used to be. There's also varieties of English. We have things like American, British, or Australian. Um, for me, when I first came to Australia um, 11 years ago, I, um, <clears throat> I thought, you know, I'm an English speaker. I'm a native speaker of English. And I had a really hard time understanding, um, particularly those with a very broad Australian accent. Um, I remember when I first came and I went to a shop and someone said, how are you going? And I thought, oh, well, I just walked here. Um, and getting used to some of the language was really interesting for me because I was an English speaker. Um, but just some of the words um, and, and some of the, the terminology, it took me some time to, to understand. Um, so even 
though I'm an English speaker, there are varieties and it takes some time. And it's interesting to even see, um, you know, there are certain countries in, in regards to English language teaching, like Japan has always really wanted American English, where there's other places that are really focused on British English. So, you know, these varieties hold different statuses in different places. Um, and why is that? I'm not sure, but um, it, it's a very interesting mix. Then we have varieties such as Singlish or Spanglish or Chinglish. Um, and I think one of the things that has been a discussion is that people think, um, well, they're not using the right grammar and they don't have the same, you know, it's not codified like American, British or Australian English. But interestingly, um, there's a bit of identity that is, is within that so that language is not owned by Americans or um, the British or Australians, but it's actually, it's a tool of communication and it can be molded to fit a particular social situation where these these particular you know singlish and spanglish and so on are used so just you know singlish is singaporean english spanglish is spanish english and chinglish is chinese english so i guess the question is who is a native speaker now in the additional reading there will be some you know if you like it's it's optional but there's some readings that talk about this idea of what is a native speaker and there there are some um you know, there's a study about Korean um, English speakers and about not wanting, you know, while some people really want to be considered an English speaker other, or a native English speaker, others feel that their identity is being questioned if they sound like a native speaker. Um, so there's, there's a really interesting mix of, of, of a sense of identity in regards to whether you're a native or a non-native speaker. Um, in one of the readings, Dear Vri and Plard talks about how language teachers end up being at a very interesting kind of place when we talk about this idea of a native versus a non-native speaker. And it can be really difficult to kind of, you know, um, to navigate, well, you know, why would a native English speaker be any better than a non-native speaker? I lived in Vietnam for five years and, um, well, at the time I had my master's in TESOL, um, I remember talking to people and they go, oh, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm an English language teacher. And they go, oh, yeah, so am I. I I've been backpacking. And I remember feeling like, well, but kind of, it's kind of not the same. You know, <laughs> well, you know, yes, we are both English language teachers. Like I'm trained as a teacher and I was a primary school teacher before. But interestingly, people just saw me as a backpacker um, because I was an English teacher living in Vietnam. And um, and. For me, that kind of, you know, so non-native speakers who may have spent a lot of time um, learning to be an English language teacher, and then they get this attitude that, well, they're actually not as qualified as someone who just grew up there. And I think that's an interesting sort of thing because even in, you know, a country like Australia, literacy proficiency is really, even if you are what's considered a native English speaker, the literacy development is, is very, very different from one person to another. So you can be, an, yeah, you could have lived in Australia your whole life, but not have very strong literacy skills or understanding of literacy. So an interesting thing that native and non-native speakers in regards to language te teaching is such a, there's such a divide because actually a lot of non-native English speakers are even more qualified than a lot of native English speakers because of their knowledge of language. Um, in this article, um, Dervry and Plard talks about um, that a native speaker, being a native speaker is about place, so where you grew up, and about social, socialization. So were you socialized within the context of English? Um, and do you have natural and authentic use? Which is very interesting because nothing in that doesn't really talk about, you know, how well you know the language. It talks about, you know, the place that you were born and that you lived and how you were socialized. Were you socialized in an English language community? So now it becomes more about the community that you've been in. So, you know, and that, what what's interesting about that idea of a native speaker is that it really gets a bit interesting when you have families that are from different countries. Um, so you may be living in a place where English is the main language, um, but you're not socializing it in a home, but are you at school? So there's all these different scenarios that makes this, this idea or the concept of native speaker not very straightforward. So just like the three circles, it's not as clear cut as it could be. And a native speaker of English is also not very clear cut because of globalization, because there are people from different family homes that have, you know, maybe they speak 
um, in their family, they speak English and they speak several different languages. Well, are they a native speaker of all of those language languages? So it gets really tricky. Um, from my perspective, um, you know, it's it's interesting to kind of to interrogate or to question is is it about language proficiency? So is it about your proficiency in language? So it wouldn't matter if you were born in an English speaking country or not. Is it about your language proficiency? Or is it about your culture? Is it about your cultural understanding? Or is it is it more about just and which you really can't have much kind of control over? Is it being accepted as a leg legitimate member of the community? So you can maybe have two different people who have the same language proficiency, but for for others, they say, no, this person is is considered more of a native speaker while this person isn't. And because of maybe culture or because of various factors. So it's it's a really interesting thing because there's there's a bit of power. Who decides who's a native speaker and what are those qualifications? And while it might be about place and socialization and the idea of a natural and authentic use, it's not always about your ability to have a strong language proficiency and then be able to communicate that to students, which is problematic. So <clears throat> I think a lot of people look at English as a national language. Language, So, you know, and that English is a really important part about cre creating national identity. So if you live in America or you live in a shire or you live in England, for example, part of your identity as being a citizen or even a resident of those countries is that you speak English. I remember being in the States and we have a lot of Spanish speakers, which I think creates such a, a fantastic um, you know, part of the identity of the USA. But at the same time, you'd hear people say, if you're going to live here, speak English. And so there's this real interesting, you know, attitudes and beliefs that, you know, if you live in one of those countries, then if you're going to be, you know, a national of that country, you have to speak English. So English equals national identity. So for many immigrants who come to English speaking countries, they feel that learning English is the key to their, their sense of identity and acceptance within this new place. Um, Bourdieu, who is a um, French sociologist, talks about this idea and that many immigrants learn English because they want to gain what they call sim what he calls symbolic, um, symbolic capital. So when we think of capital, we think of financial capital, like we're gaining money. Um, but the idea is that for immigrants, English allows them to give, gain social capital. So that means that among their peers and around people that they have a sense of status because they speak English, cultural status because they, they are kind of assimilating into this, this new culture, and economic because then they have opportunities to further their study and have jobs because they speak English. So this becomes a really important part of immigrants' national identity by learning the language. But different from, if you look at English as a national language and then you look at English as an international language, it doesn't really have, it does have status in regards to, you can be um, an English speaker in, in China and have quite a bit of status because you speak another language and the language that can help you gain social, cultural, and economic capital. But that's primarily because um, that is a tool um, to, to be able to access other people and, and so on. And a big thing about English as an international language is that it's about being an intercultural speaker. So the idea that you use English to learn, relate, and interact with others, and that's a tool. So English as an international language is not about national identity. Um, it's, about, it's a tool to be able to bridge across a variety of people and a variety of countries. Um, so a very different view of English as a national language. So Jackson talks about, um, in her article, talks about what are the characteristics of an intercultural speaker. And here are some of the things. So an intercultural speaker is someone who has intercultural attitudes. So they are generally curi curious and open and ready to learn about others' attitudes and beliefs. Um, but also they're able to look at their own attitudes about other cultures. Do they hold any stereotypes and really be, you know, kind of open to those, to their own attitudes. Do they hold particular attitudes that may be a little bit biased? Um, part about a, a part of being an intercultural speaker is about a knowledge of different social groups. So how um, and how their practices are different. So being able to compare. So and when we say different social groups, it's not always just different countries. There are so many different social groups within a country or a language group. 
Um, so, but knowledge about that and wanting to know about it, but then also being able to compare the practices. How are these countries different? How are people different? And how do I kind of relate to that? Um, skills in interpreting and relating or comparing. So that kind of goes back to being able to say, when someone says something, being able to interpret it and then compare, relate, well, what, what do you think that, that person's trying to say? Skills of discovery and interaction. So the desire to actually find out new information about a culture or, a, you know, about someone and apply it to communication, real-time communication. So knowing that maybe in some cultures, eye contact, um, while in, in a place like Australia, eye contact shows that you're listening, active listening, that it's actually a sign of respect to not look at someone in the eyes. So knowing and trying to find out that information then can be applied into real-time communication. And then the idea of just having critical cultural awareness, being very aware of other cultures and being will, willing to kind of be flexible in that. Um, so it's, it's being, you know, having a desire to learn from others, having a desire to adapt, and then uh, a desire to interact appropriately with other people. So why would students study English? What, what is the purpose? Whether you're from what Crutchfield talks about an inner circle country or outer or expanding, why study English? And I think it goes back to Bourdieu's understanding that by learning English, you invest into various forms of capital. So like I said, you could be um, in a country that doesn't speak English, but having the ability to speak English allows you, it opens doors in other ways. So speaking English allows you to interact with people from other cultures and countries. Um, so and, and in some countries, having a language like English and proficiency, a strong um, proficiency in English gives you this kind of social capital among your peers of saying, oh, well, you know, this person's bilingual they, or multilingual um, or economic capital. It opens doors for other jobs that require people who not only know the language, but can can interact with people from other cultures. So I think. It's, it's important to understand that students study for various reasons, and as teachers, we need to tap into that. So why are students studying English? Is it because of social reasons? Do they do it because their parents? Do they do it because um, they want to speak to their friends? And Because that can be a real motivating factor. Is if, if they're using it, you know, why do they want to learn English and you use that as a way to motivate them? Is it for economic reasons? Is it because they want to find a job or, um, you know, that requires English skills? Or is it for cultural reasons? Is it a status um, symbol? If they speak English, does that give them a bit of cultural capital and that they have status within the country or within their particular group of friends or, or, um, or community? So what are the pedagogical implications of English as an additional language? One of the things that we need to do is we need to expose students to different cultures and language varieties. So having them hear non-native speakers talk or speak and seeing that actually English is not doesn't is not owned by countries like Australia, um, England and the US but that English is now um, is not owned by particular countries but is used as a tool across many to be an international language to communicate with to be a bridge across many many language groups and cultures. So exposing them to that and showing that um, there's just as much status of a person who's who's a bilingual or multilingual speaker as a person that just speaks English. And I think actually really valuing that a person can have can can be proficient in a variety of languages opposed to one, I think is really important and to, to emphasize that. So um, teaching strategies to cope, to help cope with cultural differences. How do you, you know, if there's a breakdown, you know, what are the things we look for? If if someone's um, you know, having there's a language breakdown you know, break is it a cultural difference or, or so on so teaching strategies to help them be aware and look for those things um, <clears throat> teaching strategies to acquire and notice important clues to help them function well in different cultures so for example if um, you know let's say someone's not looking at you is that because it's a cultural thing or is it because they're they're finding the the communication interaction awkward what are these things and, and getting them to notice these these things the way that people are are responding um, encourage self-reflection on one's attitudes and beliefs about different people and cultures sometimes we do hold 
biases and stereotypes that we don't even know that we, we have. So really thinking about what do we think about other people and why do we think about that? And now, do we think about that because we, you know, I, mean, I remember being in Vietnam and um, I used to have uh, people say, oh, your mother must be Vietnamese. And, um, and which my other friends would think was funny, but they, they really, uh, there were some people that really thought that most Americans were, were quite obese. And so they were sure that I couldn't be American. I at least had to have a mother who, or something that was Vietnamese. So there's, you know, there's certain attitudes. And I've always had kind of certain ideas about particular groups and then met them and thought, why did I ever think? Because people are individuals. They're not, they are sometimes shaped by their cultures, but they're also shaped by their, you know, their families and so on. So everybody is so different. Um, using a variety of different approaches to learning. We'll talk more about this in next week, but um, one of the things that I found is that, you know, we talk about communicative language, you know, interaction, small groups, and so on, which is great in a lot of ways, but some students, um, you know, and it could be culture, but it could be also just personal preference, don't find that those activities are that helpful, and they actually like to have very focused instruction. So instead of saying, let's just do communicative, or let's just do routine and rote learning, have a balance. Do a little bit of both, trying to, to expose the students to different approaches and for you to use different approach, approaches to teaching language. And then the last thing is that we need to make language learning meaningful for students. So make sure you know why students are actually wanting to learn it and make it meaningful. Find ways to make it meaningful, to feel that they're, they're invested in it because they get something out of learning English. All right, this week, um, please look at your assigned readings. Um, they should now be all available for you. Um, if you have not received your textbook, it's the, um, the textbook by um, Jeremy Farmer and it's the practice of English language teaching. Um, so please get that. You can get that at the bookstore or have a look on, on Google. Sometimes there's um, some deals that can be had or second um, secondhand books. Take the Qualtrics survey, and this just to get you kind of thinking about this, exploring your views about what, an, what the native speaker construct is and more about English as an international language. This is, you know, anonymous, so it's just getting your ideas and we'll use that maybe to, we'll use that as kind of a discussion point next week um, in the face-to-face -face, um, tutorials. Also reflect on your own experiences, beliefs, and attitudes in the online discussion. So there's an online discussion in Moodle, so make sure you put those in there. And then finally, contribute to the Moodle glossary. So by contributing key terms, anything that you've read in the book. Now, in, in linguistics, in English language teaching, there are so many acronyms. So there's CLIL, there's CBLT, there's a variety of those things. So start putting those, we'll do a collaborative glossary. So start putting some key terms in there and we'll develop um, a really strong glossary for this unit. We really look forward to meeting you in the face-to-face -face, um, tutorials in week two. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I hope that this, um, this little mini lecture was helpful to kind of think about some ideas um, and maybe kind of um, help you situate some of those readings that you've, you've been reading. Um, but again, we look forward to seeing you um, not only on the online activities, your participation in that, but also in week two. All right, have a lovely week, bye.